Welcome. Today, we delve into the complex realm of misinformation, a phenomenon as pervasive as it is deleterious to the fabric of society. Its tendrils extend deep into the psychological underpinnings of human cognition and behavior. Let us commence without further ado. Sigmund, your opening thoughts. Ah, misinformation, a fascinating symptom of the human psyche's attempt to shield the ego from the harsh realities of the world. It is through this lens that individuals often distort information to cater to their own desires and fears, a concept deeply rooted in the defense mechanisms I've explored extensively. Indeed, the psyche's endeavor to maintain equilibrium can lead to the very biases we endeavor to understand. Ivan, how does this align with your findings on conditioned responses? The connection is undeniably potent. Conditioned behaviors and beliefs stem from the environment's response to our actions. If a certain piece of misinformation garners social approval or status, it becomes reinforced, akin to the salivating dogs in my experiments, conditioned to respond to a bell. It's imperative to consider cognitive development stages in this discussion. A child integrates new information, whether true or misinformation, based on existing schemas. Critical thinking skills developed over time are crucial in discerning fact from falsehood. Yes, and it is via reinforcement strategies that we can shape beliefs. Misinformation is perpetuated in environments where inaccurate beliefs are rewarded, a notion central to operant conditioning. Identifying and altering these reinforcement contingencies can mitigate misinformation spread. Experimental investigation provides a unique insight into these cognitive processes. Objective, controlled observation serves as a cornerstone for understanding the psychological impacts of misinformation, thereby allowing us to devise methods to counter its spread effectively. A robust beginning to our discourse. As we delve further into these segments, let us keep at the forefront of our minds the interdisciplinary effort required to fully understand and combat misinformation. Let us proceed with our analysis, taking heed of the intricate interplay between psychological phenomena and the propagation of misinformation. The topic of the Dunning-Kruger effect, it seems, burgeons amidst our collective psychologies. Its implication on misinformation is undeniable. Sigmund, your stance on this? Indeed, Carl. The grandiosity of the ego parades itself in such bias. Individuals, gripped by an unconscious hunger for esteem, boast knowledge they scarcely possess. A clear semblance to defense mechanisms, wouldn't you agree? This overestimation not only festers in the soul, but spreads misinformation as though it were gospel. A poignant observation, Sigmund. The journey towards self-awareness, then, might serve as an antidote. The process of individuation compels one to confront these biases. It's not merely about realizing one's limitations, but embracing them, leading to a more grounded engagement with the world. While your insights penetrate the psyche's depths, let us not overlook the conditioning of our environments. The Dunning-Kruger effect, seen through the lens of behaviorism, is but a conditioned response to societal adulations. Overestimation and the spread of misinformation are reinforced by the rewards of status and approval. A fascinating point, Ivan. However, one must consider the developmental stages in this equation. The effect of cognitive maturity cannot be understated. Education, therefore, plays a critical role in fostering critical thinking. A well-instructed mind becomes a bulwark against the snares of misinformation. Education, yes. But let's direct our attention to the environmental consequences, as Ivan hinted. Our beliefs are shaped not only by internal defense mechanisms or cognitive stages, but by the reinforcement we receive from our surroundings. Thus, accurate self-assessment and the curtailment of misinformation may be promoted through targeted reinforcement strategies. All these points, whilst valid, underscore the necessity for empirical investigation. The cognitive processes underlying the Dunning-Kruger effect demand examination. It's through experimental scrutiny that we might unearth the roots of this phenomenon. Experimental scrutiny, Wilhelm. But let us not be blind to the intricate workings of the unconscious mind. The root of this overestimation lies not in the observable alone, but in the depths of repressed desires and conflicts. Enough about depth. The practical application of our theories in educational settings is where our focus should lie. 
It is there that we can foster the critical thinking skills necessary to combat the Dunning-Kruger effect and its ilk. And yet, the environment remains paramount. Whether through classical or operant conditioning, our responses, including the acceptance of misinformation, are learned. These learned behaviors can, with rigorous methodology, be unlearned. Gentlemen, your discourse has painted a rich tapestry of perspectives on the Dunning-Kruger effect. From the depths of the unconscious to the structures of education and environmental reinforcements, it's clear this phenomenon is multifaceted. Its role in misinformation, as seen through the lenses of psychoanalysis, behaviorism, and developmental psychology, illuminates the complexity of human belief systems. The essence of confirmation bias lies deeply embedded in our unconscious desires to resolve the internal conflicts that plague us. In my studies, what emerges is a picture where the individual, driven by wish fulfillment, gravitates towards information that aligns with pre-existing beliefs. This is not merely a matter of selecting evidence. It is about satisfying a deep-seated psychological need. While Sigmund emphasizes the unconscious, I'd argue that confirmation bias also operates within the realm of the symbolic, shaping our perceptions through the lens of personal beliefs. These beliefs are not randomly selected, but are deeply influenced by the collective unconscious, archetypes that guide us in our search for meaning and confirmatory evidence. Your speculative journeys into the unconscious neglect the observable and the measurable. Confirmation bias is a pattern of learned behavior. Through classical conditioning, individuals learn to favor information that confirms their existing beliefs because such information is rewarding. It is a simple, yet powerful, conditioning of the human psyche towards consistency. Ivan, you've touched on learning, but let's not ignore the construction of knowledge itself. Confirmation bias is in essence a byproduct of how we integrate new information with our existing schemas. It's an active process where the individual is not just passively receiving information, but is actively constructing his or her understanding of the world, privileging that which aligns with what is already known. We're dancing around the issue. From a behaviorist standpoint, confirmation bias can be understood as a function of reinforcement. When a belief leads to a favorable outcome, this reinforces a tendency to seek out and prefer similar information in the future. It's operant conditioning in action. Behavioral modification, therefore, is key in addressing the issue. The emphasis has been largely on psychological processes, but we must not neglect the structural underpinnings. Through introspection and controlled observation, we can begin to recognize our biases. Only then can we aspire to a level of objectivity necessary for the empirical study of our own cognitive biases. Wilhelm, your faith in introspection is quaint but the unconscious drives will always eclipse such efforts with the desires and fears that truly motivate us. Sigmund, while our unconsciousness shapes much of our behavior, it does not render us helpless. By confronting the unknown within ourselves, we can begin to mitigate the effects of confirmation bias. Ah, but you underestimate the power of conditioning. This bias is not something to be simply reasoned with. It requires systematic desensitization and reconditioning. And yet, developmentally speaking, we cannot overlook the role of education in this process. Teaching critical thinking from an early stage can shape the schemas through which information is processed. Education, critical thinking, important, yes. But without altering the reinforcement patterns that sustain these biases, you're merely addressing the symptoms, not the disease. Gentlemen, our debates could be endless. The true challenge lies in empirical investigation to dissect these biases through rigorous experimentation and observation. Only through science can we hope to illuminate the dark corners of the human psyche. It seems imperative to start with the premise that the human memory is rather like a wax tablet, malleable and impressionable. Misinformation in its most virulent form preys upon this fragility, embedding itself as if a repressed desire a wish fulfillment that has found a perverse form of realization. While your analogy holds a certain poetic truth, Sigmund, the collective unconscious too, plays a substantial role. Shared myths, symbols, they all inform this collective memory. 
and misinformation can often spread through these channels, masquerading as truth because it resonates with these deep-seated archetypes. Your focus on the internal, on the unseen forces of the psyche, neglects the very real, observable classical conditioning that occurs. The stimulus of misinformation becomes linked with unrelated stimuli, emotions, fears, reinforcing itself within our memory through repetition and association. And let us not forget the developmental aspect of this issue. Misinformation does not simply prey on a static mind, but interacts with the evolving cognitive structures. As children are in the process of integrating new information, misinformation can corrupt these structures, leading to misconceptions that persist into adulthood. You're all circling around the point without landing on it. The environment is key. False memories, misinformation, all of it is a product of the environment's reinforcement. We should be discussing strategies for behavioral modification, for creating a milieu that positively reinforces the questioning of misinformation. Gentlemen, we must not lose sight of the empirical. Your theoretical forays provide much food for thought, but without proper investigation into the cognitive processes behind memory consolidation and misinformation, we're merely speculating. Experimental psychology offers a path to understand these mechanisms. Wilhelm, your commitment to empirical method is commendable, yet you overlook the depths of human irrationality. A solely experimental approach may gloss over the complexities of the psyche. Sigmund, even as we acknowledge these depths, we must strive for balance. The psyche may be vast and irrational, but it still operates within a world that can be observed and understood through symbols, through narratives. Observations, narratives, they're mere collections of data unless we can systematically assess and condition the response to misinformation. Our understanding of conditioning provides a concrete method for addressing the spread of false memories. Indeed, Ivan. But remember, the structure of the mind at different stages of development will mediate these conditioning efforts. Educative strategies must be informed by an understanding of these stages. Education, conditioning, terms for similar processes. The focus must be on the reinforcement of critical engagement with information. This requires careful design of the environmental factors that shape behavior. Your focus on environment, on conditioning, on developmental stages, they all point to elements of the truth. But let us not forget the need for rigorously designed studies that allow us to draw scientific conclusions about the nature of memory and misinformation. Echo chambers, gentlemen, are not just halls of agreement. They are mirrors reflecting our deepest insecurities and desires. How does our need for belonging fuel these closed systems of belief? Ah, Carl, you beckon the shadow of our narcissism. Echo chambers serve the narcissistic part of the ego, perpetuating a desire for recognition and validation. They foster an environment where one's identity is not only affirmed but idolized by similarity thus deepening the trenches of our own narcissistic tendencies. Indeed, Sigmund, but let's not overlook the developmental perspective. Our cognitive structures evolve to accommodate and assimilate new information. Echo chambers, however, stifle this growth by limiting the information to only what aligns with pre-existing beliefs, impeding our cognitive and social development. This so-called development can be explained by simple conditioning. Echo chambers are Skinner boxes of sorts, reinforcing and rewarding shared beliefs while punishing dissent with social ostracism. It's a classic case of the social reinforcement among groups. Punishment and reward, yes, Ivan, but you oversimplify. Echo chambers are indeed environments ripe for behavioral conditioning, yet we must consider the schedules of reinforcement within. They operate on a variable ratio schedule, unpredictably rewarding engagement, which makes beliefs resistant to extinction. As a matter of scientific inquiry, I insist we not forget the necessity of empirical study in these assertions. Cognitive cohesion within these groups can and should be measured, observed, and experimentally manipulated to understand the underlying processes at play. And therein lies the peril, does it not? These chambers amplify the shadow self, allowing our unexamined prejudices to run rampant, unchecked by the crucible of differing opinions. Carl, you always romanticize. The shadow self, yes, but we must consider the ego's relentless pursuit of pleasure. Pleasure found in agreement, not confrontation. 
But again, from a conditioning viewpoint, the social approvals and disapprovals within these groups strengthen specific responses. People are mere animals in a pen, conditioned by their social environment. To reduce human behavior to mere animalistic response is to ignore the complexity of human thought and the stages of development that influence one's susceptibility to echo chambers. Education and awareness can cultivate the skills needed to navigate and challenge echo chambers. Educating the masses requires a change in environment, not mere awareness. By altering the contingencies of reinforcement, society can shift away from echo chambers towards a culture of critical thinking and openness. Yet, without methodical observation and experimental evidence, all these theories remain speculative. We must dissect these social behaviors under the microscope of empirical science to truly understand and counteract the allure of echo chambers. Precisely. The depths of human psyche and behavior, shaped and reflected through these chambers, reveal much about our inherent desires for belonging and identity. But let us remember, understanding is but the first step toward addressing the consequences of such psychological phenomena. Let us now pivot to the influence of authority figures in the shaping of false beliefs and the spreading of misinformation. Authority, in its myriad forms, impacts the psyche in profound ways. Sigmund, your thoughts? Indeed, authority figures often stand in loco parentis. They activate archaic images of the father. It's a transference of the childhood Oedipal dynamic onto figures of power, making the individual exceedingly susceptible to accepting misinformation. This paternal transference compels obedience and quells skepticism. A compelling point. The archetype of the wise old man, or the tyrant indeed, can be seen to shape these interactions. Authority figures embodying these archetypes can seduce the psyche into a state of uncritical acceptance, a form of psychological enslavement, if you will. Excuse the interjection, but let us not overly mystify the mechanism. Conditioning plays a crucial role. Authority figures, much like in my experiments, act as conditioned stimuli, eliciting conditioned responses. The individual learns to associate authority with truth, irrespective of the veracity of the information imparted. But we must not overlook the developmental aspect. As individuals grow, their cognitive structures evolve. Authority figures significantly influence this development, shaping their schemas of understanding, dictating what is considered true. Early reliance on authority molds the foundation of one's reality. I must interject. This all appears rather deterministic. Through operant conditioning, we can shape individuals to critically evaluate information, irrespective of its source. Reinforcement strategies can be designed to encourage skepticism and independent verification of facts, mitigating the influence of authority figures. While your perspectives offer valuable insights, we mustn't ignore the empirical deficiency in our understanding of this phenomenon. Introspection, controlled observation, and experimental methods must be employed to dissect the intricate processes through which authority figures manipulate beliefs. Only then can we engineer effective countermeasures. Wilhelm, always the advocate for empirical rigor, yet you must acknowledge the depth of unconscious dynamics at play. The empirical must not overshadow the psychodynamic elements. Gentlemen, we tread on complex territory, intertwining the empirical with the unconscious, the conditioned with the developmental. It is clear the figure of authority wields immense psychological power, shaping beliefs and influencing the spread of misinformation. Our challenge remains to understand these dynamics and devise strategies to counteract the malevolent use of this power. Let us proceed with this multidimensional understanding as we delve further into the psychology of misinformation. In times of crises, it's evident that the terrains of the human psyche shift towards ancient, primal mechanisms. Anxiety and defense mechanisms become rampant, steering the masses towards misinformation as a lamentable coping mechanism. It's akin to a collective neurosis, where the populace, driven by fear, clutches at any straw of information that might promise a semblance of solace or understanding, accurate or not. Indeed, Sigmund, but let us not overlook the Jungian perspective where the collective unconscious plays a vital role in this process. Crises stir the pot of collective symbols and archetypes, 
manifesting myths and misinformation as a means to create some semblance of narrative coherence amidst chaos. People gravitate towards these narratives like moths to flame, seeking not truth, but comfort in shared symbols. You speak of comfort, yet from a behaviorist view, we see a clear pattern of conditioning at work during crises. The heightened emotional state conditions individuals to respond more vigorously to misinformation as they are in a state of increased susceptibility. It's similar to my experiments with dogs. Under certain conditions, responses can be amplified, sometimes leading to unexpected behaviors. From a developmental standpoint, crises pose a unique challenge to the structuring of knowledge itself. The need to swiftly assimilate vast amounts of information can lead to cognitive shortcuts, where misinformation finds fertile ground. It's not merely about comfort or conditioning, it's about how underdeveloped or stressed cognitive systems grapple with information overload and the urgency of decision-making. But let's focus on the environmental reinforcements that crises amplify. Misinformation spreads when the consequences of such beliefs are, in the short term, more rewarding, perhaps providing a false sense of security or community. Through operant conditioning, societies can learn to spread misinformation more readily during crises due to the immediate, albeit illusory, rewards it offers. Yet all of you seem to gloss over the importance of empirical investigation into these phenomena. We must dissect the cognitive processes and societal dynamics underpinning the spread of misinformation in crises through meticulous observation and controlled experimentation. Only then can we truly understand its mechanics and devise methods to counteract it. Wilhelm, your faith in empiricism is quaint, but overlooks the deep, unconscious undercurrents that no laboratory can quantify. The psyche does not unfold its mysteries under the bright lights of your so-called controlled experiments. Gentlemen, let us not derail into the dichotomy of empiricism versus introspection. Both lenses are crucial to understanding the complex interplay between psyche and crisis. The real question is, how can we translate our theoretical understandings into practical strategies for combating misinformation? Practical strategies must involve conditioning individuals against susceptibility to misinformation. We need to establish a reinforcement system that rewards critical engagement with information rather than passive acceptance. And we must not underestimate the importance of education in developing critical thinking skills from an early age. By strengthening cognitive frameworks early, we reduce vulnerability to misinformation during crises. Reinforcement and education, yes, but also environmental manipulation. We can design environments, both physical and informational, that naturally inhibit the spread of misinformation by making truth more rewarding and accessible. While these strategies hold merit, without rigorous validation through empirical studies, they remain speculative. Let us commit to the scientific method using our diverse perspectives to illuminate and ultimately mitigate the role of misinformation in crises. Our discourse, heated though it may be, underlines the complexity of misinformation in crises. Each perspective, from the depth of the psyche to the structure of learning environments, contributes to our understanding. Let us move forward with the recognition that an interdisciplinary approach is not merely beneficial, but necessary. Rumors and gossip, they are indeed the social fabric's darker threads, manifestations of collective unconscious desires and fears. They serve a cathartic purpose, releasing pent-up emotions and fulfilling psychological needs for connection. While I acknowledge the collective unconscious's role, let us not overlook the power of narratives in shaping these rumors and gossip. They tap into archetypal themes, resonating with our deeper shared human experiences, it's a reflection, not just of individual psychic conditions, but of the collective psyche's shadow. Your focus on the unconscious and the archetypal forgets the simple conditioning mechanisms at play. Rumors trigger a conditioned emotional response, excitement, fear, its basic stimulus response. The group reinforces these behaviors, making misinformation spread more efficiently. Developmentally, rumors and gossip offer a means to navigate social dynamics. They serve as tools for understanding societal norms and testing the boundaries of acceptability. Their appeal might stem from a cognitive perspective, 
where individuals are attempting to construct their reality in a social context. You're all missing the simplest explanation, reinforcement. Rumors and gossip provide immediate social reinforcements, attention, a sense of belonging. These are powerful operant conditioners. By understanding these mechanisms, we can perhaps mitigate the spread of damaging misinformation through alternative reinforcement strategies. Gentlemen, your theories have merit, but we must not ignore the empirical. To truly understand the psychodynamics of rumor and gossip, we ought to conduct controlled observations and experiments. What processes are at work when a rumor spreads? How are group dynamics and individual cognitive functions contributing to this phenomenon? Wilhelm, while your empirical approach is commendable, you underestimate the depth of human irrationality. Rumors are not just information, they are wishes, desires manifested. They cannot be fully understood through mere observation. Indeed, Sigmund. But let's not disregard Wilhelm's point. Empirical research could offer valuable insights into the mechanisms behind rumors spread. However, this must be balanced with a deeper understanding of the symbols and archetypes at play. Symbols, archetypes, you're obscuring the simple truth with complexity. We see behavior, the spreading of rumors, it's a learned response. Strengthened by reinforcement, weakened by punishment. And let us not forget this behavior evolves. As children develop into adults, the nature of gossip and the reasons for its spread change. It's an adaptive mechanism in a social learning process. Adaptation, perhaps, but one that can be manipulated. By changing the environment's contingencies, we could potentially reduce the spread of harmful rumors. It's a matter of applying the right reinforcements. All your theories, they suggest interventions, but without concrete evidence, we're merely speculating. The foundation must be observational data, which leads to theory refinement and effective strategies. Observational data can never fully capture the human psyche's depth. Our desires, fears, the very essence of rumor and gossip are beyond mere data. They are expressions of our deepest selves. And yet, in exploring these expressions, we must strive for a balance between empirical research and an appreciation for the more profound aspects of human nature. Only then can we hope to understand the true nature of misinformation. Misinformation, a scourge fueled by fear and anxiety, twists the wellsprings of the human psyche. Let us delve deep into how these shadows of our mind landscape fertilize the ground for falsehoods to flourish. Sigmund, your exploration begins. Ah, fear, anxiety, the primeval soup from which much of human folly emerges. Misinformation is but a symptom, my friends, of our neurotic attempts to fend off the unbearable, to swaddle ourselves in the comfort of illusions, rather than face the harsh light of reality. It is the unconscious mind at play, seeking refuge from the spectres of uncertainty and dread that plague our existence. It's the shadow, indeed, that enshrouds our ability to discern truth, casting its long veil over our perceptions. Misinformation, in this light, is not merely an external foe, but a reflection of our internal struggles with the unknown aspects of ourselves. Facing one's shadow is paramount in dispelling the mists of falsehood. Conditioning. Fear, the strongest conditioner of them all. Your lofty tales of shadows fail to acknowledge the simplicity of the mechanism. Misinformation spreads and takes root because fear conditions us to respond, to jump at every shadow, to see threats where there are none. It is the bell that makes us salivate for lies. And yet, how does one's cognitive development interplay with this anxiety-driven acceptance of misinformation? As children grow, they learn to navigate the world through schemas. But in a state of fear, these very schemas can become rigid, regressing to earlier stages where black and white thinking prevails and misinformation becomes the unchecked intruder. Fear, anxiety, misinformation, they are all but variables in the vast experiment of human behavior. You speak of shadows and unconscious desires when in reality, what we face is a simple matter of reinforcement. Misinformation is reinforced in a state of fear because it provides a false sense of control, a balm to the anxious mind. The solution? To alter the reinforcements to reward skepticism and the pursuit of truth. Empirical investigation is crucial. We must not only philosophize about the psyche's vulnerabilities, but also rigorously test hypotheses about fear, anxiety, and their role in the susceptibility to misinformation. 
Only through controlled observation and experimentation can we hope to understand and thereby mitigate the impact of these emotional states on human cognition and behavior. Wilhelm, your insistence on empirical evidence is commendable, yet it neglects the profound depths of the human soul. The mysteries of the mind cannot always be laid bare in the laboratory. Gentlemen, let us not forget, the complexity of the human psyche defies simplistic explanations. It is the interplay of the conscious and the unconscious, the individual and the collective, the biological and the spiritual, that shapes our susceptibility to misinformation. Carl, you wax poetic, but overlook the basic principles of learning. Fear and anxiety are not just byproducts of mythical internal struggles, but conditioned responses to stimuli, which can be unlearned. Understanding development stages indeed offers a lens through which we can view susceptibility to misinformation. But conditioning and reinforcement, Ivan Skinner, do play roles in shaping how these stages are navigated. The point, gentlemen, stands thus. Alter the environment, the reinforcements, and you alter the behavior. Misinformation thrives on fear and anxiety because it is rewarded, not because of some unfathomable depth of the unconscious. While conditioning and reinforcement offer a lens, without the methodical rigor of empirical study, we grope in the dark. Only through the light of investigation can we begin to untangle the complex interplay of factors that contribute to the spread of misinformation. Thus, we return to the labyrinthine nature of the psyche, a domain where fear and misinformation intertwine in the dance of shadows. It is through confronting these shadows, through understanding the conditioning mechanisms at play, and through rigorous study that we may yet find our way through the maze. In our modern world, the deluge of information bombards the senses, pushing the mind to its limits. How does cognitive load and information overload contribute to the spread and acceptance of misinformation? Sigmund, your thoughts? The psyche, overwhelmed by this information deluge, resorts to primitive defense mechanisms, Simplification becomes a retreat, a sanctuary for the mind's stability. It's the unconscious mind's attempt to shield itself. Yet, ironically, this simplification fosters misinformation. For in its haste, it discards nuance. A complex defense mechanism indeed. Ivan, from your perspective, how does cognitive load influence conditioned behavior in this context? Conditioning requires repetition and clarity of signals. Yet when bombarded by excessive stimuli, the organism's discriminative capacity dwindles. What we observe is a reliance on previously conditioned, familiar cues, even if misleading. This information overload thus blurs the lines between accurate and inaccurate signals, fostering a fertile ground for misinformation. This discussion touches closely on cognitive development. An overloaded mind regresses to simpler, heuristic-based cognitive operations. Information overload not only strains cognitive capacities, but compels the mind to fall back on less sophisticated, albeit error-prone, modes of understanding. Misinformation, then, preys on these cognitive shortcuts. Yet, this challenge also presents an opportunity for operant conditioning strategies. If we can structure environmental reinforcements to reward critical evaluation and discernment, amidst information overload, we can potentially mitigate the reliance on heuristics that lead to misinformation acceptance. Empirical observation is paramount. We must systematically study the cognitive processes under duress from information overload. Only through meticulous empirical work can we design educational strategies that foster resilience against misinformation by enhancing information literacy. Your insights highlight the underlying psychological challenges posed by information overload. Yet it seems there's contention on the strategies to combat these challenges. Strategies must engage with the unconscious processes that drive simplification. An approach that neglects the psychoanalytic dimension is incomplete. But without understanding the conditioning mechanisms at play, how can we hope to devise effective countermeasures against misinformation? Developmentally informed education remains crucial. We immunize the mind against misinformation by equipping it with the tools to critically evaluate information, complex or otherwise. And reinforcement of these critical evaluation skills must be consistent and strategic to be effective in the long term. Let us not forget the indispensable role of empirical research in all this. Hypotheses and theories must be rigorously tested. 
a spirited debate indeed. It is clear that misinformation, amplified by information overload, tugs at the very fabric of our cognitive architecture. Each perspective here underscores a facet of a multifaceted problem. Our understanding, much like our strategies, must be holistic. The human psyche naturally gravitates towards the path of least resistance, which in the case of heuristics, is an unconscious endeavor to simplify the complexities of the world. It's a manifestation of our internal desires and fears, designing shortcuts that, while efficient, often betray the pursuit of truth. Indeed, Sigmund, but to go further, these heuristics, or shall we term them psychological archetypes, not only simplify but also mislead, guiding us with the lanterns of past experiences into the fog of misapprehension. They are the shadows on the wall, shapes formed by the firelight of our collective unconscious, and in their dance, they distort reality. Yet, we must consider the conditioning that underscores this process. These so-called shortcuts are nothing but conditioned responses to the environments we've encountered. If an individual is consistently rewarded for quick, heuristic-based decisions, why would they stray from this path irrespective of the factual inaccuracies it may lead to? That's a reductionist view, Ivan. The development of these cognitive shortcuts or heuristics relates intricately to stages of cognitive development. As children grow, they seek patterns to understand their world, patterns that evolve into heuristics. Thus, the issue at hand is not merely one of conditioning but of the development of thought processes. Education must strive to advance beyond simple heuristic reliance, fostering analytical and critical thinking from an early age. Gene, while your point on developmental stages holds merit, the solution lies in operant conditioning. We must mold an environment that rewards not the speed of decision-making, but the accuracy. Through reinforcing critical analysis over reliance on heuristics, we can shape behaviors conducive to discerning truth from misinformation. However, gentlemen, empirical investigation into these phenomena is paramount. It is one thing to theorize about the origins and impacts of heuristics on misinformation acceptance, yet it is another to systematically observe and experiment. Only through such meticulous study can we truly comprehend the mechanisms at play and thus devise methods to counteract the nefarious effects of fast thinking. Wilhelm, empirical studies you clamor for, yet you overlook the basic tenet of psychoanalysis, the understanding of the unconscious motivations driving these heuristics. Without delving into the depths of the psyche, your empirical data hangs but in a void, devoid of meaningful interpretation. Gentlemen, I urge we temper our fervor with reflection. Each of our perspectives, be it driven by psychoanalytic theory, behaviorism, or empirical study, sheds light on different facets of the underlying issue, the role of heuristics in the acceptance of misinformation. The challenge lies not in discrediting each other's approach, but in synthesizing our insights to pave a way forward. Synthesis, Carl, requires acknowledgement of the fundamental drivers of behavior. Conditioning, not archetypal symbolism or unconscious motivations, offers a clear path to understanding and altering human responses to misinformation. Let us not forget the role of cognitive development. Without addressing the root of how information is processed from childhood, any attempts at changing behavior in adults may prove futile. And so, the round goes. While each theory holds water, an amalgamation, guided by empirical research and an understanding of reinforcement, could perhaps offer a beacon amidst the fog of misinformation. Indeed, an interdisciplinary approach, grounded in rigorous scientific methodology, may yet hold the key to unraveling the complexities of human cognition and misinformation. Well, gentlemen, as we approach the end of our roundtable, it's time we each provided a summative reflection on the complexity of misinformation and its underpinnings in psychological mechanisms. Freud, would you care to begin? Indeed, one cannot overlook the depth of the human psyche in contributing to the spread and acceptance of misinformation. It's an irreducible complexity that misinformation caters to the most basic of our desires and fears. It plays upon our repressed thoughts and primal instincts, weaving itself into the fabric of our dreams and anxieties alike. While your psychoanalytic approach offers insight, 
Freud empirical studies are paramount. We must observe, measure, and quantitatively assess how misinformation impacts cognitive processes. Only through meticulous experimentation can we unravel the intricate ways in which misinformation distorts perception and memory. Both of you touch on valid points, but let's not overlook the fundamental conditioning processes. Misinformation, akin to Pavlov's dog salivating at the ringing of a bell, can be seen as a conditioned response to stimuli, often repeated through various media. It's the patterns, the reinforcement, the schedules of these stimuli that shape belief. And yet, we mustn't ignore the stages of cognitive development. How misinformation is interpreted and accepted depends greatly on one stage of intellectual growth. Children and adults do not process misinformation alike. Hence, understanding these stages is crucial in crafting educational mechanisms to combat its spread. Education alone is insufficient. Operant conditioning techniques should be implemented to reinforce critical thinking and skepticism. By adjusting the environmental consequences for accepting misinformation through rewards and punishments, we can shape behavior towards a more discerning engagement with information. Your points underscore the multifaceted nature of misinformation and the need for an interdisciplinary approach. As we've unearthed today, the roots of misinformation are deeply entangled with our psychological processes, be it through the lens of psychoanalysis, structuralism, behaviorism, developmental psychology, or conditioning. It's evident, then, that the challenge of misinformation can't be battled on a singular front. Precisely. A broad methodological approach is essential. Psychological, empirical, and even philosophical inquiries must intersect if we are to make any significant headway. Conditioning society towards a resilience against misinformation will require rigorous dedication and patience, much like my work with the dogs. The key lies in developing cognitive resilience from an early age, fostering a culture of critical inquiry and reflective thought. And let's not shy away from utilizing technology and media in our reinforcement strategies, making use of modern tools for antique problems. Indeed, gentlemen. As our discussion concludes, it's clear that understanding and combating misinformation requires not just interdisciplinary research, but also an introspective examination of our own cognitive biases and susceptibilities. Let us then, in our various capacities, continue to probe, challenge, and educate both ourselves and the society at large on the perils and complexities of misinformation.